let, let's talk let's talk with the fair and impartial policing program because this this I think um, is is a big is a big way forward. I appreciate you having that conversation with me, by the way. Um, so the fair and impartial policing program, you were you were heavily involved in this. So please explain what it is, what the point is, what it does, and what the goal is, and what it wants to do. Okay, so what happened was, uh, oh, I mean, about eight or nine years ago, the Toronto Police Service was looking at ways to uh, talk to uh, you know the entire service about bias, about implicit, explicit bias, um, and uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, sort of started this was looking at uh, you know st- stats were taking about who gets pulled over. Um, you know, is there a certain demographic? Is there, um, you know, a, 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 you know, do more men get more pulled over, more people of color? Uh, is there an age group? Um, and why is that? And likewise, um, we have a, a, used to have a, a practice here where we would, um, it, it became known as carding, where someone could be you know, randomly stopped. They didn't have to talk to police, but they could be asked, you know, their name, their address, all that sort of stuff, why they were in the area. Uh, and that information would be cataloged. And so um, it became apparent that, again, a different a, a demographic was being uh, stopped more often than not uh, for non-criminal matters and looking at why that was and in what neighborhoods. And the concern that uh, came out of that was that um, the uh, neighborhoods that were being targeted were uh, low-income neighborhoods And the um, people who were getting stopped more often than not uh, were young black men. And so uh, we had to then look at why is that happening? Because these are for non-criminal offenses or just randomly being stopped. And is it just a case of there are more young black men walking around than, you know, young white women or what's going on? And from that, we then started to look at... um, is there a bias when police officers are looking at uh, criminal activity? So in other words, is there a, an implicit profiling going on where you think, uh, you know, two people walking down the street, which one uh, is likely to be the criminal? And so uh, the Toronto Police Service uh, purchased a program from the states called the Fair and Impartial Policing Program. And what they looked at was how uh, the assumption is, and I agree with it, is that we all have biases. Some of are explicit, which is stuff we can work with, um, and some is implicit. And so you can say, well, it's an implicit bias. How do I even know I have it? And if I don't know I have it, then how can I manage it? What's, what's um, the difference? Explain it between explicit and implicit. Explicit is you know you have a bias. Um, I mean, the example I use is, um, you know, I know I would prefer to eat um, potato chips over paper clips. If you put a bowl of potato chips in front of me, a bowl of paper clips, I'm going to choose the potato chips every single time. I'm good with that. I own it. I I will argue that that's the right thing to do. I believe in it. Right. So that's an explicit bias. Implicit bias is where you do things and you don't really know why. Um, and is it from uh, the way you were brought up? Um, like, for example, there's certain foods I don't like. I've never tried them. But I, I'm, I'll say I don't like them. And that's an implicit bias because there's no reason why. It's just been kind of around me or things I've seen. When we're dealing with people, we look at, um, you know, who do we think is likely to commit a crime? And how much of it is actually statistic-based versus how much of it is our bias? And when we look at statistics, are those statistics backed up by having arrested more people from that demographic committing those crimes than people who are also committing the crimes, but don't get arrested. So in this program, it was a one day uh, program where every member of the Toronto police service, whether they were civilian to like right up to the chief had to take this. And we looked at a variety of biases, um, whether it was people of color, whether it was a, a gender thing, whether it was youth, um, and again, we only had a day, so it wasn't a lot, but uh, it was really interesting um, conducting the, the the program and facilitating it uh, because you're trying to get discussion with the officers. And of course, if you sit in a room full of you know, 20, 30 people and you tell them that they have explicit 
and implicit biases and they have implicit biases against certain people, which is why they're always arresting those people. Uh, it can sometimes be a hard sell. Right. But hopefully by the end of the day, if nothing else, we got officers kind of thinking about what they do and why they do it. I think that's a phenomenal start. Um, especially when it comes to biases, I, I would, I would assume the biggest, uh, bias is racial. Um, that, that, that is taught. Um, how about financial? Financial bias. That's, yeah, right. It, it comes up. I mean, you work in, um, you know, uh, an, an impoverished community. And you know, it's like, well, of course these people do this. You know, it's like, well, you do the same thing. Right. right? When we talk about, um, you know, in impoverished communities, in, in um, community housing, you know, and you see people sitting out, you know, on the side, like they're standing on the sidewalk, you know, having drinks and whatever. And it's like, you know, this is terrible. Well, what's, what's any different from, you know, people in middle-class environments uh, on their driveway, having their wine, mm -hmm. you know, absolutely yeah. nothing. And, and, or, or even in the backyard, right. And just having, yeah. having a barbecue. Yeah. And the difference is that the other people don't have a backyard. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's a difference. If, it's, it's public. You, yeah. Yeah. You know, you're an impoverished community and you want to have a beer with your friends. Uh, you go to the beer store, you buy a can of beer and you sit on the park bench. Right. Yeah. Because they don't have a living room to go to. I, th I think a lot of problems that are addressed as racial. Yes, they are racial, right? These racial implicit biases clearly exist. But I think the bigger problem is financial. Like if, if you, why do people commit crime? Mostly because most of the time because they're poor. Yeah. My right? yeah. rich people don't need rich people create different types of crime, right? Yes. That they they create more harmful type of crime that they always get away with. So that's a completely <laughs> different type of crime. Middle class people typically don't commit those kind of crimes that it's personal, like murder, mostly murder. <laughs> I would yeah. assume or assault, but then, yeah. right? Then, but like when it comes to general crimes, <clears throat> poor people commit more crime, not because they're a certain colors, because they're poor. And then we look at why are people poor. Why are people right. poor? Exactly. Right. Who is going to be poor? Not and again, not because they're not because of that, not because of that color. Mm -hmm. It's because they're poor. Or, or is it right? Because there are certain opportunities that are not made available because they don't have the look of the CEO. You know, um, and I, I teach at a, a community college, and I took some ideas from this for one of my courses, and I, I did a whole thing about like, you know, what does a serial killer look like? Right. You know, and white guy. You know, you know typically, a, white typically guy, it's a white guy. Me. They look like, they look like me. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. a white guy. And you know, like, like Ted Bundy, you know, mm -hmm. a very good looking handsome. white guy. You know, handsome. Very handsome. Just like Char you. Charismatic. Right? Oh, thank you. Just like so you. Flattered. Right. Yeah. So again, right. That whole thing. But when we think of, um, and again, in criminality, it's like, you know, who is a criminal? Well, anyone who has opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, or anybody, and so be, anybody in need, anybody who needs something. Yeah. Right. And so you have to sort of be able to, um, be able to go beyond your biases. And we also look at like your biases came from your family of origin mm -hmm. and your neighborhoods and your communities. It's also ingrained in your DNA, right? Biases, biases exist from thousands of years of evolution, which yeah. is very, very hard to just undo. It takes, exactly. it, takes it takes generations. And yes, you know, the, the progress of the wheel of progress rolls slowly. And yes. I, I, I do think in the past, in that, that progress is speeding up in the past decades but yep. think of where we were 200 years ago. We've made a bunch of progress where we were 2,000 years ago before that. So Absolutely. It's, it's, it's very hard to undo what we genetically know. And I, I know you mentioned in the, on the website on the program, it's like they do teach you it's not your – like sometimes it's not always your fault. You, know, you, don't, you, just, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, exactly. So like how, how is it actually taught? Like so who are the people – teaching this and what exactly are their qualified? Like what makes them qualified to teach on implicit bias? Well, the pro we, we purchased the program and then um, <laughs> there were about 20 of us who were trained to be facilitators. Mm -hmm. And so basically we run through the program that was developed and we did it for a year and it was like crazy busy and exhausting and fun and not so fun sometimes. Um, but the idea is that we're not going to fix anybody and we're not going to get fixed, but it's to raise that awareness and to start those conversations, right? Because there's nothing we're going to teach you in a classroom that's going to change your life. It's what you take away, right? So are you going to have a conversation with uh, maybe the person you carpooled with, or are you going to go home and talk to your family about it? Or, 
you're going to go back to the station and say, this is the stupidest course I ever had to go on in my life and then proceed to talk about it and then proceed to talk about why you don't have biases. And in so doing, talk about your biases. Right. So it's, it's so it's getting, but it, but it gets the conversation going, it gets people thinking. Right. And it's a, it's a, it's a tool. It, it's not a cure all. It's just a tool. How do the officers respond to it? Cause I could see some actually taking it in like people, some being just brushing it off and being like, ah, this is, this is fucking stupid. Right. Like how, yeah, how do yeah. generally, generally how do officers respond to it? Cause I, I really, I really do hope they would, they take it with the grain, they not grain of salt. They take it open-minded. They go in, looking to learn something as an opportunity. Like you don't have to agree, but you have to understand. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, for the most part, I mean, it's really interesting. We found that if we had really interactive classes, which were fun, um, the uh, evaluations at the end were like, you know, this was okay. You know, time could have been better spent. The classes that we had where the officer sat with their arms crossed, leaning back, completely shut down. It was like pulling teeth. The evaluations, they said, this was really great. This is something we should have had uh, years ago. It's like, what? Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, like stupid's always going to be stupid. Haters stupid. always going to hate. Kind of stupid. Yep. Right. And, and so there's going to be those people that are just going to think this is a big waste of my time, energy and everything. But I think for the most part, um, I, I like, how do you measure success? it's like a generational thing, right? Like, has it changed? Like, you know, the next day, did they go back and they were like, you know, completely fair and impartial in their policing? I doubt it. Um, but if it made a bit of a shift, then it was a success. Yeah. If you, if you inch a little bit forward here and there, exactly. that, that can make a big difference. Well, exactly. I, I think Desmond, I think that's phenomenal. Um, I'm glad you're involved in this program and I hope it continues to evolve. And I think it really could make a difference whether the cops want it to or not. Cause Hey, they might implicitly, they might say it doesn't make a difference, but in the back of their minds, implicitly they might, subconsciously they might. Well, well that's it. They, and they built ahead. on to it from that. Uh, they did that program for one year, then built on, and they continue to build every year uh, and looking at, you know, like different things like, like poverty, like mental health, like gender, like orientation, you know, gender expression, all kinds of stuff. Things that are really important uh, within the communities in Toronto.